thank everybody for coming to seminar today. I'm really excited uh, to hear we have um, four scientists with us today who are going to talk about their recent um, cruise to Antarctica. Um, and so we'll hear a little bit about sampling in the time of COVID and some of the interesting research that they that they did while they were down there. Um, so I'll go ahead and let Will give the introduction. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, so today's talk is titled uh, Science Down South, Highlights from the 2020 Icy Inverts Antarctic Cruise. And before I get too far in, I want to uh, introduce our science team. So here are the 19 scientists that participated in the cruise. Uh, the cruise was led by five PIs uh, and a combination of four different projects. We had Sarah Gherkin from the University of Alaska Anchorage studying cumaceans, Kevin Kosat uh, from the University of Alabama, uh, who I'll, we'll get into his project a little later, Derek Learman from Central Michigan University studying sediment microbes, and Andy Mahone from Central, Central Michigan University, as well as Ken Halonit from Auburn University. Uh, and the primary PIs on this trip were Kevin, Andy, and Ken, with Ken being our chief scientist. Uh, with me here today, however, are Nick Roberts from the COSOT lab at University of Alabama, Mike Tassia from the Halonich lab, and Candace Grimes from the Halonich lab uh, from Auburn University. And they're going to talk a little bit about uh, their lab science and their experience on the cruise uh, after my piece here. And I was lucky enough to be involved in this cruise. Uh, there I am here in my great little hat. Uh, I was lucky enough to be involved in this cruise because um, Kevin is on my PhD committee and he needed an extra set of hands and I was more than happy to lend mine for this cruise. Uh, so what was our IC Inverts cruise? It was the 19 scientists you saw on the last slide um, where we spent 85 days at seas at sea and covered 90,000 nautical miles or 9,000 nautical miles. The overarching goal was to explore the biodiversity, evolution, and biogeographic patterns of animals living in the Weddell Sea in the Bransfield Strait. And here to the right, you can see our ship's path. This is very unusual. We rode from San Francisco all the way to Punta Arenas, Chile, where we made a short port call, and then to down to the Weddell Sea, where we actually were able to do our research. Uh, this track is very unusual. Usually when you do Antarctic work, uh, you fly down to Chile where you board the vessel and head to uh, what LC. But because of COVID restrictions, they didn't want to put us on airplanes. And we actually boarded the boat in San Francisco and rode it all the way down. So this trip really started for us uh, on September 23rd in San Francisco when we boarded the Nathaniel B. Palmer here. Um, that same day, we left port and sailed about one day to Port Huanimi, California. And we actually got to sail beneath the Golden Gate Bridge here, which was very cool. Um, once in Port Huanimi, we actually stayed two weeks there at port on a shipboard quarantine to make sure that no one on board was sick. We also went through a battery of four COVID tests, a two week ship's quarantine to make sure that nobody on board had COVID before we went to sea. So that's you know something that was definitely unique to this cruise. But what was really nice was that after that two week shipboard quarantine and after we left port, we were actually able to remove our masks and have some semblance of a normal life. It was kind of a nice reprieve from our pandemic. Um, so after that two week quarantine, we were finally underway on the Palmer. And after about 24 hours of sailing, we were in open ocean and this was our view, you know, it was open ocean and deep blue water all day, every day. And we were underway for a little over three weeks. So this was our view for three weeks and it was beautiful, but you know, it, it was pretty much the same every day, but we did manage to keep busy. The Palmer is equipped with a ping pong table that has to have the best view of any ping pong table in the world. Um, and we were able to celebrate all the major holidays we missed back home, like Halloween. So here's uh, our lab group dressed up in our Halloween costumes for the Halloween competition. The Halloween uh, party on the boat was complete with absolutely spooky science themed uh, Halloween decorations. These are, these certainly scare me. Uh, but that definitely kept us busy. And after three weeks aboard the Palmer traversing, or after a month and a half aboard the Palmer, but three weeks underway, we made it to the ice finally. Uh, and after so long on the vessel, this really did feel like a triumph. That first time we got to see ice, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, and after finally making it to the Southern Ocean, we were able to begin our sampling. So once sampling started, the science team you saw earlier was divided into two 12 hour shifts. Uh, and you basically worked 12 hours straight and then you slept for 12 hours straight. 
Uh, and it was during this time of the cruise that I really realized I have been slacking off for my entire professional career with only working eight hours a day when I can clearly work 12 hours a day. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think things are looking up. I will finish my PhD after all. So with our starting of sampling, we, uh, this is kind of what our sampling looked like. We were either sampling using a box core, a multi-core here, uh, a Blake trawl or an epibenthic sled, which I didn't have a photo of. But these are the different tools that we use to sample the bottom and to uh, sample the fauna down in the Southern Ocean. So uh, most days we sampled the fauna using this Blake trawl, which is just a big net that we would drag along the bottom. And depending on the water depth, using this could take anywhere from you know, 45 minutes to eight hours. Uh, and it would come up and be absolutely full of animals that would get dropped into this large deck box. And then all of the diligent scientists would lean over the box and sort through it. Um, and sometimes this net came up and it was just absolutely clean and full of clean, beautiful animals. And sometimes it came up just absolutely full of mud, which was not the, uh, was not the intended goal. And in this case, we would have to sieve the animals out of the mud uh, before we could start working with them. Um, once the animals were on deck, we would sort them broadly by, uh, phyla or by phylum or class, depending on um, what they were. So here we have some large macrofauna, like this giant isopod or these cushion stars uh, or this massive scale worm. Um, and these all went to the Helanich lab group, uh, the Helanich and Mahone lab group, uh, where they will use them to investigate cryptic diversity and the biogeographic patterns in Antarctica. Um, so they really took all of the large macrofauna and that was their primary interest. And when I say large, I really want to emphasize how large these were. I mean, that's the biggest scale worm I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was absolutely huge. So uh, the Helanch group took these large animals and Candace and Mike will tell you a little bit more about what they did with them later. But the COSOT group, which was the group I was a part of, are really interested in the small macrofauna and the myofauna, like the animal seen here, like this great spiky uh, mollusk called a cotophobia here, or this marine leech, or this very, very tiny solitary polyp called Lacanaria. This is a 500 micron glass bead here. So that's half a millimeter. So this guy is tiny. And these were really the scale of animals that, um, that we were looking at uh, in the COSOT lab group on this cruise. And that kind of brings me to my role on the cruise. I was in charge of the identification and preservation of basically all of the small annelids. Um, so every day I would pick out all of the small annelids, identify them as far taxonomically as I could, which was usually to the family level. Um, and everyone else would pick out the small worms that would pass through their dishes as well and put them aside for me. So we saw things like this great, uh, this great terabellid here that has this pharynx that comes out, this extremely tiny little worm here called a Dorvalade. So this is a millimeter. So you can see he's extremely small. And these little black marks here are actually his jaws. So this is a very tiny worm with some very big teeth. Uh, and these very weird looking uh, sternaspid polychaetes. This is actually their head here. They look like little barbells when their head is out. But that head can be sucked in, like in this one here. Um, yeah, so people would set these aside for me. Um, and if the people were on my shift, they would just put them in a dish and hand them to me. But if they weren't in my, on my shift, I would find them in the cooler the next day. Or sometimes I would just walk back up to my scope and just find you know, a dish of worms casually waiting for me, like this lovely little soup dish of maldanids, uh, bamboo worms, called that for their segmentation. Um, or these neftiids here. This was another time I just walked back to my scope and just found a dish of worms sitting there. Uh, what would frequently happen um, is that they would just be uh, left there. And one morning I even came in and found this dish waiting for me. Uh, this was probably one of the finds I was most excited about. You know, I never really was able to identify these down to the family level, but they did keep me pretty interested for, the, for at least one morning. Um, on one particularly distressing day, this is what I woke to find from the night shift, was just an entire shoebox full of tangled, mismatched polychaetes. And what's really upsetting for me about this image is you see up here, it says 94 annelids, volume one, because I believe there ended up being like three shoe boxes of these worms just waiting for me. So that was a particularly busy day. So after I sorted the worms down to the family level, um, I would then photograph them, which sometimes took some doing, as you can see here, note the flash between my knees here, uh, and then preserve them in various preservatives that would either protect DNA, RNA or morphology based on how many of the animals we found and 
you know, what our intended goal for those animals were. Uh, and we really did find a lot of worms. We collected over 30 different families of annelids consisting of hundreds of uh, individual annelid collections. Um, so these, here's a few more of my favorite pictures of some of the worms like this affiliate here, which uh, just really smelled terrible. Or this little phyllodocid here, which you can see has these little paddles, it's called a paddle worm. They use these little paddles to swim. Uh, this amphoretid here, these uh, large tentacle looking things are actually it's branchy. These are how it's breathing. Um, it's just some of my favorite pictures here. Uh, and my role on this cruise was really unique because while I got to participate and help collect and ID many of the animals, um, that's really where my involvement with this project ends. And that's why I've brought in uh, my friends, Nick, Candace, and Mike to tell you a little bit more about their lab science and kind of the end goal and the purpose for these samples. But this cruise really was a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. And it's definitely changed my perspective on what constitutes difficult or you know, remote field work. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically how uh, my role in the cruise went through. Um, and with that, we'll now uh, hear a little bit from Nick. Uh, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the COSOT lab group's role and um, his experience on the cruise. So with that, I will hand it over to Nick. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, let me share my screen here. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Nicholas Roberts. I'm a member of the COSOT lab. I'm sort of the, the middle child PhD student. Um, and yeah, I'm going to sort of explore and tell you guys a little bit about what the COSAL lab was up to in this big multi-PI, uh, multi-person effort to sample in Antarctica. Um, just sort of just sort of a quick introduction uh, to some of the cool stuff we did. We got to go on land. This is a place called The Nays. Um, it's pretty far down there. Um, it's not as far as you can get. It's just before you hit the, the Waddell. Um, and in the corner right there, that's Nathaniel B. Palmer. It's, it's about 300 feet long, um, and which is pretty big as far as research boats go. But um, it's pretty small if you spend three months on it and get to know everyone and become absolute best friends. Um, so that's a great time. Um, but a big part of the research we were doing and what sort of funded Kevin's part of uh, portion of the cruise is a NSF career grant that he recently uh, recently got. Um, the big title of it is Revolutionary, Revolutionizing Biodiversity in Systematics Research on Aplicophora and Training the Next Generation of Invertebrate Systematists. Um, a Sort of a standout word is Aplicophora. Uh, you may not have heard of what Aplicophorans are, um, and that was really our main research goal where we're down there is to collect Aplicophorans. Um, so I'm gonna, before I get into what an apicophron is, I'll, I'll go a little bit over what the COSOT lab sampling strategy was sort of like. Um, Will showed you, we'd pull big samples up onto the deck and we'd put them on sieves of different, differing sizes all the way from a millimeter to maybe 50 microns and sort of wash the organisms through them. Uh, we're looking for stuff that's pretty hard to see with the naked eye. And so we sort of have to trust that the smuts that ends up at the bottom is what we want. We will then take our sieved samples and we'll bring them into the lab. Uh, this is the COSOT lab space. Um, there were four of us there at a time on shift um, and there are dissecting microscopes and you can see um, that right here, we have these cooling stages that would pump ice through basically what is a, a CPU cooler um, that would keep the animals cold while we looked at them. So keep them alive, which is really helpful for identification sake. Um, then we would capture their, their essence. Um, typically we had, we would use a macro photography setup. So it's a, it's a big macro photography stand. Um, and we also have a dissecting microscope and a compound microscope all hooked up to cameras, um, which is really important because a lot of morphological features like coloration get lost in, in preservation. And then we would preserve them. Uh, here's me with a sort of uh, magnifying eyepiece, um, clearly on four hours of sleep and little little coffee sort of sorting through and picking out stuff that we'd already identified and, and popping them into vials of ethanol or uh, formalin or RNA later if we wanted to do some genetic work later on. Um, so our main goal, aplicophorans. Um, quick introduction to aplicophorans. There's two large clades. There are codophoviata, 
They are burrowing apocophorans without a foot. Um, this is one that we actually found out in the Antarctic, which is codifoviates are a little bit more rare. So we're very excited to find these guys. Um, a plaque, A meaning no, and plaque meaning shell means that while these are mollusks, they don't have a shell. And so you can see that they sort of resemble worms, but don't let that fool you because their um, morphology is a little bit more distinct than that. The second group is selenogasters. They are empibenthic crawlers, predators. Um, they have a foot. You can sort of see the line right here. Um, and they use that to crawl around on the surface and a little bit below the surface and sneak up on their prey, which happens to be rhizoans, corals, um, any sort of stationary animal. Um, Aplicophorans are super interesting because they have uh, sclerites, which are calcified scales that sort of overlap in a lot of different ways. And this one you can see is sort of a cross-hatching pattern. Um, and these are what protect them. So they lack a shell. However, they have these sort of armored sclerites, sort of like chain mail that overlap over their entire body. And you can see this one's little foot right here. This is another Antarctic specimen. This is proneomenia. Um, so what we do often with aplicophorans is because they're so rare, and even in the Antarctic, because they're so hard to find, is we have to do as much with a single specimen as we can. Um, there were at least six plus specimens where they may have been a new species and we only found one of them. Um, and while aplicophorans are super diverse and plentiful in the Antarctic, um, they're still super rare. Um, and sometimes certain species like this guy can be extremely hard to find. Um, what we'll do is we'll bring a preserved specimen home, pop it on an SEM. We have, fortunately, in the COSAT lab, a low voltage tabletop SEM where we can get beautiful SEM photos of them, take that out and subsection them for uh, histological work. So this is sort of like slicing the organism up into a bunch of small pieces to look at its internal morphology. Um, uh, as you can probably guess, they don't have a lot of external features besides feet and sclerites. And so we need to look at their insides and how they differ to sort of identify them. Um, if we're lucky and sort of have the resources at the time, we'll do micro CT, which uh, goes through the organism, gives us the 3D image of what it looks like on the inside, sort of like histology. And we'll take a sample for barcoding um, because they are so hard to identify. It helps um, scientists in the future and uh, all around the world to sort of identify these creatures. Um, a shout out to APLAC base. If you're curious about more about aplicophorans and what aplicophorans are and how many there are and what they do, um, head over to APLAC base. It is a website put together by uh, another COSAT lab member, Megan Yepchungo, and our postdoc, Carmen Kobo, uh, aplacbase.weebly.com. Um, I recommend this if, if you find these creatures at all interesting. So um, apocophorin sort of only covers the, the first part of our funding for this work. Um, another, another thing that I'm mostly focused on is revolutioning, revolutionary, revolutionizing uh, biodiversity and systematics research. Um, the COSAT lab uh, focuses on small invertebrates, um, particularly the squishies, um, like this entoproct here, which is a, a pet group of mine that I'm, I'm I have taken quite a liking to. This is a loxosamella from the Waddell. Um, we like to focus on the small stuff because apocophorans are small, so why not focus on anything else that lives in or near them? Um, we tend to focus on the squishies, uh, Lophotrochozoa, otherwise known as spiralia, sort of includes a lot of the worms, for example, annelids like will studies, flatworms, nemertines, uh, a lot of sort of maybe mysterious to you unnamed, un unrecognizable names of worms, um, in essence, we look at small um, sort of wormy things. Um, but because we are also focusing on small organisms, we're finding just tons of diversity in our sieve samples. And so I'm just gonna show you some pictures of cool stuff that we found. Um, this is a uh, amphipod known as uh, from the family Epimeria. You can see it's really cool red eye right here. It's sort of in a big plate of armor. These guys are really cute and um, and super plentiful in some samples. Uh, this is a nemertine. You can see up here, uh, it's proboscis in its mouth and you can see it's lateral slits. Um, this is cephalodiscus, uh, it's a hemichordate. Um, Mike will expand a little bit on, on cephalodiscus and how cool they are, but uh, these guys were super interesting. They're pseudocolonial and um, really plentiful in certain samples that we'd find in the Antarctic. Um, this is Serratus rollis. It is an isopod, um, sort of looks like a trilobite. These were some of my favorite organisms that we found um, because I am a paleontologist at heart. 
uh, these guys are super cool um, and can be, you know, an, an upwards of, of maybe six inches across. So they can be pretty big and they're super plentiful in some samples. Um, Sarah Gherkin, who you saw earlier, studies chemations. Um, these guys are sort of like apocophorans. They're hard to find in some places and they also live epibenthically. Um, what is really critical to her work is of course, um, looking at morphology because these guys are also hard to identify. And we were lucky enough to have a wonderful camera set up to sort of capture colors um, that you wouldn't see in preserved specimens. So this cruise is unlike, you know, past cruises uh, 20 or 30 years ago in that we can really capture high quality uh, specimen images at tons of different focal lengths to um, sort of preserve what organisms look like before they've been put in, you know, formalin or ethanol for a very long time and really lost a lot of their cool coloration. Um, this is just another really cute guy that uh, I'm very fond of. These are euphrosinid annelids, um, sort of furry and cute. They're very small and they curl up and sort of sort of hug anything that you, you give them. So I'm big fans of these guys. Um, however, all this wouldn't have been possible without the night shift. Um, this is of course the 12 hour shift that I was on with Candace, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Um, there was a lot of night man, day man jokes. Um, I think the night shift was probably one of the best shifts, but maybe I'm a little biased. Um, the MTs, marine technicians and marine science technicians, all this work would not have been possible without their help. Um, setting up trawls, giving us chemicals, uh, holding our hands when we were crying because we couldn't sleep, uh, all sorts of things. And um, of course, Kevin Kosar, our fearless leader, uh, clearly tired and looking for apocophorans here. Um, so yeah, that is really what the COSAL lab is focused on and I'll, I'll hand it over um, to Candace. Um, so yeah, um, so my name is Candace Grimes, sorry, um, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Auburn University. Um, and I will be talking about the ICM birds cruise as well. Um, I am gonna start off with some fun videos and then we'll focus on the scientific goals. I also want to start off with a shout out to the entire science crew for making this an extremely fun and memorable trip. Um, so now I'm going to go back to the beginning. Um, so you see, before we could get on the ship, we had to quarantine in this lovely hotel at the San Francisco airport, uh, where we were allowed to walk outside um, around <laughs> the uh, hotel for about an hour a day due to the pandemic. Um, so you can see it was a pretty nice walk, um, but it was a definitely an interesting way to start out our three month ex excursion here. Um, so after we passed our first COVID test, we were allowed to board the ship at Pier 17 near downtown San Francisco. And this was the first time the ship had been in the States in about 20 years, um, of course, due to the pandemic. Um, and we were able to, uh, as Will said, you know, travel underneath the Golden Gate Bridge aboard the icebreaker of the AOB Palmer, um, which was truly awesome. <laughs> um, so then we began our long journey south through the Pacific uh, with this view from the bow, watching the rolling blue waves in the water. And this was uh, toward the stern. Um, so during the trip down, we spent a lot of time in the computer lab or in the conference room working on various projects, trying to pass the time. Um, but we had to remind ourselves every once in a while to step outside just to watch the waves and the sun go by. Um, we also had to enjoy the journey Sorry, I better turn this off because that is kind of funny. Um, <laughs> I especially like walking out on the catwalk on the bridge, even though my heart sort of jumped at this part when you're walking over the water. <laughs> um, but it was still a lot of fun. Uh, and then we had our first signing of land in uh, three or four weeks uh, was the Patagonian Mountains uh, as we were passing through the Strait of Magellan trying to get to Punta Arenas in Chile. Uh, is truly awe-inspiring looking at these snow-capped mountains. And then we finally reached the ice. We all came out on the bow to see. Um, there were penguins running around in front of the boat. <laughs> um, now, when, when Will mentioned uh, that we were aboard the RVIB, the thing that we ponder, the IB is the icebreaker part. So here you can see us, we're going between you know four or five knots or about five miles per hour through the thin ice, uh, which is about one foot or less thick. Uh, now you can see the captain's making these turns, uh, trying to stay in ice that we can get through. But you see, sometimes it gets pretty bumpy, pretty rough. Uh, it's a thicker density ice. So um, 
Uh, but when we came to the thicker ice, sometimes um, we couldn't actually just bump on our way through it. So we actually have to break it. Um, so the way the ship does that, and you'll see we hit a, a rough spot that we couldn't quite break through. The way the ship does that is it will back up. You see it back up. You can see the blue water and all the ice that we were breaking through. And then it rams forward on top of it. And then it, it sort of comes up on top of the ice and then uses the weight of the ship to break through. So we can find a new location to go to. Or so we can get like through at least a little bit further. Sometimes it takes a couple tries. Um, this ice is, you know, probably three or four feet thick. Um, so it's a little bit thicker. Uh, but yeah, so that's how we were breaking ice. Uh, this is at the stern. So you can see the ice chunks coming up. Uh, it gets pretty thick. Some of these are, um, you know, they look like they're three or four foot thick. Uh, but some of them are less thick than that. Um, so we were lucky enough to be able to go onto land, uh, which was a lot of fun as well. Stepping out the boat for the first time in well over a month, uh, looking out onto the ice. Okay, on to the science. So the primary goal of the grant with Auburn and Central Michigan uh, was to understand environmental factors that have shaped present day diversity in marine Antarctic invertebrates. Here are some photos uh, showing the diversity of the sea floor. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, so the red dots here, you can see there's two red dots here. I'm going to connect them. Uh, that's 10 centimeters in length. So here you can see this uh, fairly large sponge, probably 40 centimeters wide, maybe 50 tall. You can see the shadow. You can see it's got um, the sponge is inhabited by several crinoids or feather stars. Um, and if you look closely enough at the ground, you can see these adorable little sea spiders. Um, and then uh, you can also see little brittle stars. Uh, some of the other uh, sites that we visited were more dominated by these brittle stars, um, Astrotoma agassizii. Uh, and this is uh, one of the target species for the cruise. Uh, we had several target species. Uh, including sea spiders, uh, brittle stars, bryozoans, and several others. Um, and this brittle star uh, will extend its arms up into the water column. You can see sort of extending this wave pattern here, um, trying to filter deep. Uh, if you zoom in on some of these sediments, uh, you can see these little strings coming out of the holes. It looks like this. Um, and this is home to the terabellid or spaghetti worm. Shown here, we got several of these. These are one of our, my favorite ones to collect because whenever you mess with their tentacles, they sort of attract and stand up. Uh, if you also look in close at the sediment, you might find one of these little spiky worms, also known as Flabella gerids. Um, these were also another one of the ones that I thought was really fun to collect. Uh, we called them flabby geralds. Uh, when we brought the creatures up, we would sometimes put them into roam around, uh, collected substrate just to see how they move and they act. Uh, so this is a polynoid uh, scale worm. So you can see his scales overlapping here like armor plate. And here is a phyllodosa worm, so one of the dragon-faced worms that Will showed in his. Uh, and they use their paddle-like parapodia, as you can see here, to swim in a petri dish. So in addition to the diversity that I was uh, just talking about, we were also interested in how invertebrates have become distributed in the water surrounding Antarctica. So the major hypotheses for this are the Antarctic circumpolar current, which would hypothetically move uh, larvae around the continent uh, and dispersing marine invertebrates around. Uh, another idea is uh, bottlenecks or population growth due to cycle superficiation, so uh, you know, melting and formation of glaciers around on and around the continent. So we were uh, interested in looking at that due to some recent genetic work out of the Hilanish lab here at Auburn on mitochondrial, mitochondrial genomes of the Antarctic analyte Palaeonolatus, which is frequently found here. Um, and they're super fun to try to get off of um, that coral that they're found on. Uh, it's a Thorell coral, it's found in it a lot. Um, and uh, the Helanich lab has recently found that um, the populations found in the Ross and the Weddell seal, so the, the Weddell is up here um, and the Ross down here, 
are um, sort of uh, become a clade uh, compared with samples from out here. Um, so they're more closely related uh, between these two, which is interesting. Um, and recent 2B rad sequence data on the sea spider Nymphon austral, shown here, um, sort of suggests the same thing. So you see population three in the uh, gold and yellow um, is found up here near the Liddell and also down in the Ross, uh, but not in this Western Antarctic um, region. So these recent data uh, has led us to the goal of determining if previous transantarctic connections account for the similarity between the Ross and Liddell basins, uh, which may be more likely than the Antarctic circumpolar current hypothesis for distribution of these marine invertebrates. In this figure, you can see how we think the two have been, how the two seas have been connected more recently. Uh, so this is with the Western Antarctic ice shelf collapse, uh, which would have allowed gene flow uh, between these two basins uh, more recently than we previously thought. Uh, so this was one of the focuses of the release. Um, while on the ship though, I was also able to be a part of a little uh, side project with uh, Kyle Donnell, who was one of the um, recent undergraduate graduates <laughs> on the ship. Um, and we were looking at the brittle star distribution because we had noticed in this species, uh, Ophinos victoriae, they would be sort of spatially distributed. So here you can see them pretty spread out in one of the Yoyakin photos. So when we brought these animals up, we kept them in a, a large freezer that was aptly named Big Antarctica, where we spent a lot of time um, looking at these two trays. Uh, with the help of the wonderful marine technicians, um, we were able to build this to secure because the boat was moving and the trays would move around a lot so <laughs> they helped us secure them um, and then we would put a gopro on this pole up here so that we could record how the brittle stars were moving uh, after we put them in these bins uh, and there's a picture of Kyle Donnelly so this is what uh, the videos looked like so here you can see the brittle stars are separating um, and they've got you know overlapping arms after a little bit um, here's a video at sediment level, so you can see how the brittle stars sort of extend their arms forward and then they'll lift their central disc so that they can get that forward progressive movement. So after we recorded the trials on the ship, um, I'm still going through the videos, sort of plotting the location of the central discs. So here you can see what I've been spending time doing right now. Um, so that we can get a plot that looks like this. So we can continue with uh, spatial point pattern analysis to see if they are distributing themselves in a patchy, uniform, or um, random way with uh, Morisita's index. Uh, and if you guys are curious about that, please ask, because I think it's very interesting. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you guys for listening and special shout out to the ASC and the ACL folks and the entire science crew. Uh, it was a wonderful trip. Uh, and thanks. I'll pass it off to Mike. So yeah, uh, my name is Michael Tassia. I'm in Ken Halanch's lab. I'm the senior grad student. And today I have the fortunate opportunity just to kind of show you some pretty pictures and talk to you about like the overall workflow of individual sampling events, what goes into uh, planning them. Little disclaimer, it's a lot of pretty pictures and videos. So a lot of the science that is derived of this, Candace has talked about, I'm not gonna talk really at all about my own science, but please let me know afterwards in questions or anytime really at my email is on the first slide if you would like to know more about science. Another disclaimer that was maybe not planned when uh, we scheduled this in the first place, I got my second dose of the COVID vaccine yesterday. So I'm not firing all, all cylinders, but I think most of the people that were on the cruise kind of would tell you that I've never fired on all cylinders. So bear with me if I'm a little slower, talk over myself. So when talking about uh, what goes into choosing a sample site, how the sampling goes, there was more or less a schematic for how those decisions got made. And the first one was geographical site selection. These were mostly predetermined in the grants by Andy, Ken, and Kevin, uh, depending on what kind of previous data was available. Uh, they would make decisions on the route that we would go. So Ken and Andy were primarily interested in the Waddell, whereas um, Kevin was interested in the Waddell, but also some deep samples that were known to be sediment or fine sediment uh, size 
rich, dense, dense sites for myofauna. So after those decisions were made, which were primarily discussed between Ken and the uh, captain when it came down to, is there ice? Can we make it through the ice? Uh, the next thing was to arrive at the site and we would do some bathymetry um, using uh, multi-beam. So that would give us an idea of whether or not the sediment was flat, whether it was dense. So on the, in this video, you're looking at the multi-beam data showing us the overall flatness and um, I think the colors denote the accuracy of the estimation, or it might be the, the elevation of the ocean floor. But this was important because um, if, the, if the site was like 2,000 meters or 1,000 meters, it could take hours upon hours just to send the equipment down, sample, and bring it back up. So we wanted to make sure that um, we could at least sample appropriately without damaging equipment, which did happen a few times. Um, that would be a fun question to answer after this. So after the, we got an idea of what the topology of the ocean floor looked like, we would send down a yo-yo cam or a yo-pro, uh, one being camera, one being GoPro. In this video, you're seeing the uh, yo-yo cam being sent down uh, by the wonderful Colin Brayton, uh, or rather he helped it over the edge and there's a winch operator that's lowering it down. And it would go down to the ocean floor and at the beginning of the video, which maybe I can just like skip back, you might be able to see this little dangling weight at the bottom. So the way this worked is once it got to the, the ocean floor, it would uh, contact the ocean floor and it would trigger the shutter and it would take a picture. So this, this camera, which was in a pressure and water resistant housing, would fill up a memory card and it would bounce along the ocean floor effectively. So the ship would move at a Dord's pace, which is a neuterbrink joke for those of you in the know. Hold your applause for the end. Uh, and the, the winch operator would then kind of bounce it up and down according to the tension results on the winch. So those would get brought back up and we would get the opportunity to look at pictures like the one in the back. And then we would make decisions on the actual sampling method, um, whether it was Blake trawl or epibenthic sled, and then finally sediment collection. So let me take a sip of water. So in terms of the yo-yo cam imaging, the, the the ecological structure of the ocean floor was very different depending on where we were sampling. So in this top left picture, you can actually see the weight in the top part. Let me actually get this cool little laser pointer. I'm colorblind, so it's not great for me, but so this is the, the little weight that would contact the sediment and then trigger the shutter. Um, and you can see a bunch of sponges and crinoids and asteroids in this picture. In this other one, there are a lot of semi-burrowing epibenthic uh, ophiroids, a single um, anemone, a buttload of shrimp, that's a technical measurement, and then a bunch of flubibrank tunicates and uh, lyrateus um, tenophores. So the it was very heterogeneous across the entire distribution of samples and sampling sites that we went to, and it was very exciting because we never knew what would come up until the entire housing was brought up and we were able to offload the pictures and look at them. Um, and you know, some of them are worthy of like desktop backgrounds for sure. All right, so as mentioned before, uh, the Thlonish lab was primarily interested in macrofaunal sampling. Um, myself, I was uh, tasked to getting the photo vouchers for a lot of the organisms after the subsampling. So this is primarily where I spent my time. So I don't have much about the myofaunal samples, but uh, Nick went over that and you know, I'm sure he would love to answer questions about that too. So macrofaunal samples, the primary way that we acquired these was through Blake trawl, which just kind of like scooped up the top of the sediment um, in a much more uh, aggravated way, I suppose, than epibenthic sled. And then that would be brought back up and dumped into a big box where we would go through and sort stuff. And on a good day, we would bring it up and it would just be these clean, awesome organisms. And we would go through it. And you may have guessed on the less awesome days, it would just be this big pile of like chocolate mousse sediment that just made a mess everywhere. And uh, we did still go through it, but it required a lot more uh, tending to, if you will, to find the organisms inside there. So here's a little video of what this kind of looked like. This is the first day of sampling actually, or the second day of sampling, one of the first couple of days of sampling. So you can see buckets kind of like eschewed everywhere. Um, off to the side, uh, a lot of the scientists were going through and picking stuff out according to whatever the taxonomic rank was that they felt comfortable sorting it to. But in general, for things like 
echinoderms where we could determine whether it was a feather star, a sea star, a brittle star. We would sort those out to class on the deck. The idea was that we want to be moving at a fast clip. That way we didn't have animals dying and we um, lost integrity of the, the DNA or RNA or whatever we were interested in. So uh, in this case, everyone's going through, this is the, the night shift. So I had just woken up in this case and I started filming on my phone. You'll see Caitlin Reddick in a second up on the, uh, on the catwalk. There she is, she waves now. Uh, no, nope, doesn't wave. But uh, a lot of the time we would wake up and it would either be coming up or already up. And then after the sample sorting on deck, which was just a loose um, higher taxonomic rank sorting, it would be taken into the uh, big lab inside and we would sort it according to morpho species. And once it was sorted down to morpho species, which did take a lot of time, um, then determinations would be made on how each individual was subsampled so that if we needed to do population genetics, each individual was put into cryo, or if we were doing transcriptomes, we could put it in RNA later. And you can see me in the bottom left here on my camera stand, Sometimes the organisms were really easy to take pictures of because they were the size of your fist. Other times you saw uh, very large sea stars that were difficult to photograph and that'll be the next slide. But on the right, the video, you can see um, it kind of takes a village to get everything done efficiently so that you don't have these mass mortality events in the lab. Um, Will is preparing a sample a sea star to cut up. Caitlin at the very beginning was sampling a bunch of bathyplodes, this, this part, um, bathyplodes sea cucumbers and it certainly you know, was a, a, a labor that was enjoyable, but also very taxing on us. So in terms of organisms, polar gigantism, uh, Will talked about large polychaetes. On the right is a pretty uh, startling video of a nephted, but a lot of these animals are extraordinarily large. So the third from the left um, polychaete in that silverware tray was like the size of my ulna. It was, it was very large. Um, and then in the middle, I'm holding an astrotoma individual using the little fisherman's trick of holding in front of me, but it's still very large from, from tip to tip of arm. This is probably like three or four, three feet, four feet, something like that. And on the right is this large nefted that um, we were sampling and became, you know, a, a photographer's dream and did some cool little displays of aggression or it was upset. I don't know if it was aggression. I'm not an ecologist. So a lot of these organisms, very cool to see, once in a lifetime event. Um, in terms of myofaunal sampling, uh, Will and Nick talked about this already, but we would either bring up the box core, which would take a single you know, cubic sample of the sediment when it was soft, or a multi-core, which basically had um, an individual, I think it was 12 or 16. I never really directly interacted with it but it would go down, press into the sediment, it would bring up uh, cylinders where it could then be partitioned up into subsamples. Um, but whenever this happened, it would require this assembly line of the scientists that were on duty at that time, uh, just going through various different pore size sieves, and then the effluent would be put into the increasingly um, smaller sieves so that we could partition the samples into sizes, smaller and smaller sizes. Um, this wasn't something that I directly interacted with after the sampling, but on deck, this was something that required everyone to work together in order for everyone to get the samples that they needed. And that leads me into my last slide. Um, the real science on the trip were the friends we made along the way. Um, you, we truly could not have done this without such an amazing crew and group of people. Um, I miss them dearly. They were my family for three months, and uh, I'm happy to say that whether it was the crew, the science, the marine techs, or the scientists, everyone got along really well. And we did some amazing science and had some really good times. So egregious penguin stuff. And thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Mike, Nick, and uh, Candace for uh, joining me with this. And uh, real quick, before we get into questions, I do want to just give a major shout out to the uh, ASC and ECO support crew and uh, support team and boat crew that we had. I mean, this trip would not have been possible without the like incredible technical help that we received from ASC. And I just cannot uh, downplay their role. I mean, can't underscore how important they were enough. Cool. Well, this great talks, everybody. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of our speakers or for 
you know, a general question or specific questions. It also looks like Matt Lewis is here. Um, so big thanks to Matt. <laughs> and Colin's here too. Colin. Uh, yeah, the, these were the marine technicians that made the science possible. They're arguably more important than us most of the time. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It literally would not have been possible without them. And yeah. when we were in transit, they were goofing off just as much as we were. <laughs> insane. We're getting a lot of comments about how much people like the pictures. I also liked the pictures mm -hmm. a lot. Thank um, you. So, so can I just ask what, what your favorite thing you guys found in terms of, of the huge diversity you saw? What was the best? Uh, I ticked off a bunch of taxonomic bucket list animals. We all, I think everyone got the chance to see a monoplacophorin. Um, which was truly insane. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a, a, a nearly zero percent sampled group of mollusks for anyone that doesn't know. Um, and then a, a bunch of terebrinth species, which is a group of animals that I work on. That was my favorite. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely. Macrophonally, the flabellagerids that uh, Candace showed. I love those. They were just like jelly worms made of jelly they had the decency to make their bodies transparent so you could just see their entire organ system which was really cool um and myofonally too many to count man there was just an incredible diversity of uh myofauna in general but especially the myofonal annelids just really really kicked ass and couldn't pick one if i even if i wanted to i think a real highlight for everyone was um at towards the end of the trip we got to see a whale fall on the uh, the Yo Pro or the Yo Yo Cam, um, which was ex you rarely get to see those, um, and so it, it was captured and, and they tried to capture it again, but they, they couldn't get it. But it was it was one of the most exciting days to be on the boat. Um, everybody was talking about the whale fall. People woke each other up like whale fall, whale fall. So that was really exciting. I think oh Mike's got a picture of it right here. Oh, well done, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, a truly rare event. It was amazing to see this. That looks pretty fresh too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was such a cool find. Um, we were just sitting down in the electronics lab and it popped up on the screen. It was just, we were just trailing the YoPro video and we spotted it and it was enough of a big deal that Ken was like, we should go back and, and see if we can get it because it, it doesn't cost us that much time at this point at the end of the cruise. Let's give it a shot. Um, you know, we came up zero. But... That's awes't. I didn't have so, a favorite either. I'm a big worm lover, but I did sort of fall in love with brittle stars while on the ship because I was playing with so many of them for the brittle star movement stuff. So that long have, one was pretty wild. That was yeah, really I have I have now uh, sea stars and worm earrings, so we're we're got both. <laughs> You're diverse. Diverse. Um, so, so we got another a question. What was the hardest thing about living on board a ship for such a long time? Mm. I got one. Uh, I, I wore shoes for three months without ever taking them off except to sleep and shower. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if anyone is much of an addict as I am, but if you haven't had an iced coffee in three months, the first one when you get back uh, on land is probably, it's a religious experience having an iced coffee again. Um, so yeah, that was it for me. <laughs> For me, I'm in the, I have a dog and I'm just in the habit of like taking decently long walks every day. You can't walk more than like 50 feet in one direction. And that's like the longest hallway. Uh, and so that was for me, I missed being able to, you know, like walk around. Me too. I walked the, before I went on the trip, I was walking my cat twice a day and I missed both my cat and the walks. <laughs> cool. We got, um, uh, a couple of questions on the whale. Um, did you see the whale body and do you know what kind of whale it was? And did you notify Noah of the whale carcass and try to get a fin match? Uh, that was the only photo that we were able to get. Um, like uh, Mike mentioned, we tried to go back and get photos of the entire carcass, but um, the weather uh, deteriorated and we were unable to get another photo. Um, I didn't, I have no idea what's been done with the photo of it or if Noah was notified, um, unclear. Yeah, the fin match thing is a good idea. I'm going to get in touch with Ken and um, at least bring it up. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's a, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Very, very people. 
Yeah, yeah, we're really not people. pneumologists. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. We were like, we we're like, oh, look at the steerokinus in the whale. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think the the most interesting is like, oh, I wonder, I wonder what kind of scavengers are on there. Let's let's talk about the invertebrates. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you see any worms on there? See brittle stars trying to eat them? That was yeah. Os eventually, right? Eventually, not. I mean, that looked fresh when we saw it. Very we were like, fresh. this is really recent. Um, mm -hmm. But they did record the coordinates, so yeah. there's the potential for you know future investigations. Uh, are there any final questions before we thank our speakers and um, end our seminar? Oh, okay, cool. Well, thank you all very much, um, and thanks everybody for coming and and um, seeing the talk. So. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. having us. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining joining me, guys. Great to see y'all. Anything for you, Will? Yeah, anything, Will. <laughs> <laughs>